So let me talk about journals. Um, a lot of companies had journals. IBM had a journal. Uh, Bell Labs had a journal. Other companies have had journals. Um, and they serve multiple purposes. And a lot of people don't know what these journals really were. First of all, they're a marketing tool. They allow the company to have some publication that makes them sound really, really smart and uh, allows them to show off. Um, and so, you know, you, you, not only do you need to convince upper management to buy your stuff, but you need to have the engineer say, yeah, the Hewlett Packard stuff's really good. You should buy the Hewlett Packard stuff. So the journals kind of attack the, uh, the, the techno guys, right? Now, the journals can, like I said, be a marketing tool. They can also be helpful within the company because the engineers want to tell their story. They want to show off their babies. They want, they want to be proud of what they're doing. And the journal allows them to do that. You know, if you were allowed to publish in the journal, that was very, very fancy, right? You, you, you made a name for yourself if you were in the journal. And uh, the other thing that journal can do is to... Um, this is kind of a misunderstood one or a not well understood one, I should say. If you have an idea that you want to protect, you don't want anybody else to steal your ideas and stuff, you get a patent, right? And the patents, uh, the deal with a patent is that you tell everybody in the world how you do something and then you're protected by the patent for a certain number of years. Well, what if you don't want to tell everybody what to do? Uh, well, then you can do something called a trade secret. You can just keep it to yourself and tell everybody, you know, don't tell anybody about this. It's a trade secret. And uh, that's, you know, okay. Unless somebody else figures it out, then you're, you know, <laughs> then you're out of luck. Um, something you can do, though, if you want to protect an idea without getting a patent, you just publish it. Because if it's in the public domain, you can't get a patent. Uh, if somebody tries to patent something, you can pull out, hey, that was published in the Hewlett Packard Journal and, you know, on March 1st, blah, 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 blah then you can't get a patent. It's public information. Sorry, can't do it. So a lot of times things were published in the journal just to make sure nobody else took these ideas and patented them so that you can't use them, right? Use them against you. So anyway, um, there's a particular instrument that was in this journal of the um, Hewlett Packard Journal that I was interested in. This is uh, September of 1966. And this is a universal bridge. It's a very odd one. I haven't ever laid eyes on one before in industry. Um, but I've always was fascinated with them the way they worked. Um, I actually used the um, operator's manual or, or service manual for this particular instrument because it had a very good write-up of how capacitance bridges work and inductance bridges work and what are the equations for uh, uh, for the D and the Q of the uh, of, of uh, capacitors and inductors and stuff, right? The uh, dissipation and the uh, quality factor. And so I've used, so if you try to learn electronics, um, you can go and look at a whole bunch of old uh, service manuals from Tektronics and Fluke and stuff, and they will teach you how to do electronics. You know, there's really good write-ups in these old um, service manuals and stuff. And this particular uh, LCR meter had a very good write-up in its technical uh, journal, uh, technical uh, service manual. Um, but then I found it actually was written up in the um, Hewlett Packard Journal as well. And uh, this has some nice di diagrams in it that I want to talk about. Uh, they talk about how this thing works and why it's so simple on the front panel. It's kind of got these automatic things inside and allows you to not have to think too hard uh, when you're using a bridge. Some of these bridges are really complicated and kind of hard to figure out. But this one's super, super simple. And uh, here's the here's the the thing that I found very useful in the uh, uh, service manual, and here it's reprinted. It talks about how an impedance, uh, how a resistance bridge works, right? If you have an unknown, well, then you just balance that on the bridge against one that you do know. And, and when the bridge is completely balanced, then you know that everything matches, and that your unknown is just a, a ratio of the other three resistors, and it's easy to find. Now, if you have a capacitor, uh, you can model the capacitor as a capacitor with a resistor in series or a capacitor with a resistance in parallel, depending on the, res re the capacitor. Sometimes it's better to model it in a parallel function, or sometimes it's better to model it in a series function. And uh, the same with a uh, with the bridge here. You need to measure it in one way or measure it in the other way. 
And so again, if you have an unknown, then in the other side of the bridge, you put in a known. So you have a known capacitance and a known resistance, and you balance the two, and then you know what your unknown was, right? One of the clever things here, though, is here's, here's your inductance uh, bridges, a series inductance bridge and a parallel inductance bridge. And you can see that they're balancing that with capacitors. Well, how does that work? Well, you remember the Smith chart, you know, capacitors are on the top and inductors are on the bottom. Well, they're kind of equal and opposite, right? They have a different sign. They have one's pluses and one's minuses. And you can balance one for the other. And here you can balance a series inductance with a parallel capacitance. And here we're going to balance a parallel inductance with a series uh, capacitance. So they're quite clever. And uh, I found that really fascinating. And, and uh, um, this is all described in the... Uh, service manual too. I'll, I'll create a, a GitHub that all of these uh, uh, files will be available in. And uh, they talk about how it works. It looks a lot like a vector network analyzer. Right? You have amplitude and phase, and that's what we're doing here. We're gener we have a, a, a reference generator, and we're, we're remembering its phase, and then we're going through the bridge, and we're measuring its phase, and we're comparing these two phases. So very, very, very similar to a VNA. You know, it's, it's all the same. There's not a lot of new things in electronics. It all boils down to very, very simple ideas. And uh, so here, here it is used, a phase detector and amplifier. And you adjust it so that the amplitudes are correct and the phases are correct. And then you know what everything is. The um, dissipation factor and quality factor is a, uh, uh, a phase information that you need to balance. Okay, and here's the design team, uh, Ito-san, Koguchi-san, Noguchi-san, Suzuki-san, and Yoshimoto-san. So here's some clever guys. This guy looks very smug. <laughs> this guy looks, this guy looks, guys look, looks like the salesman here. <laughs> anyway, uh, and then there's a good write-up on how the whole thing works and these diagrams and stuff. Now, at the end of this thing, though, is an appendix, and it's quite... Uh, quite good. Let's take a look at the, how good this machine is, though. Look, it's uh, one picofarad to a thousand microfarads, one percent accuracy. Um, inductance, one microhenry to a thousand henrys, one percent accuracy. Uh, resistance, ten milliohms to a hundred, uh, ten megohms, one percent accuracy. 1966, guys. <laughs> no microprocessors, no op amps. This thing was designed with transistors. Uh, yeah, you go try that. But the appendix is really cool. It shows all of how the phase information works in uh, in these bridges and stuff. And guess what? <laughs> Although they don't call it a Smith chart, yeah, this is a Smith chart. It, it's all of the uh, 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 resist, uh, reactances and, and resistances that you're going to be measuring. And it, these are all of the curvy lines that I've talked about in Smith charts, right? And, uh, yeah. Anyway. Um, so if you haven't guessed by now, uh, I bought one of these things. So yeah, let's go play with it. All right, here's my beast. Uh, 4260A, Universal Bridge. I don't know what the, five, the little Dymo label here, 575. I'm not sure who, uh, who owned that. What was their uh, code for their uh, internal division or whatever? I don't know, 575. And uh, yeah, it's really, really clean. It's a, it's a really nice one. And uh, so it has this cool lap counter here that, that does the work. <laughs> so really, that's the only knob you turn. Uh, there's a range. There's a range knob, so you can see here, like, nanofarad, picofarad, microfarad. And we're in um, parallel mode here. Now you can go into series mode. And uh, then you can go into ohms. Or you can go into millihenries. Henry's, micro Henry's, yeah, that's pretty cool, and and uh, series and and parallel. So yeah, lots of fun. Uh, let's uh, let me show you the back. So you hook up the unknown here. So the thing that you don't know, you put it here, and then basically you just kind of find the range and then turn the crank, and that's all. That's all you have to do. It's really easy. Oh, this thing's kind of heavy. It's got a big transformer in it. So the back is a little interesting. It has. Um, uh, some external inputs. So it has a one kilohertz internal uh, oscillator, but you can insert 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz externally. 
Um, let's see here, bias. You can you can you can bias these things with a uh, uh, external battery. Um, and then you can add some external resistors to balance the D and the Q more accurately, depending on what you've got. Um, and you probably can't read this right here, but it says Yokogawa Hewlett Packard. So you wondered why all those guys had Japanese names? Well, Hewlett Packard had a joint venture with Yokogawa. So there, there was the YHP division, YHP Yokogawa Hewlett Packard. And this is Tokyo, Japan. So this was actually, uh, actually made in Tokyo. Um, yeah, pretty cool. So uh, yeah, it's turned on. All right, so let's grab a uh, capacitor and we'll put the capacitor here in the uh, unknown. And we will set the bridge here to CP auto. So what this is doing is it's trying to match the capacitance, but it's automatically matching the dispersion at, at, the, the, at the same time. Um, but if you want to know what it is, then you go to these other settings. So if you just want to know the value of the capacitor, though, you just you set it to auto, all right? And then you start flipping these uh, range switches, and you look at these lights over here. And you can see that this, uh, this kind of went over that way and over this way. And then you watch these guys, and these are decimal places as well. All right, so it sort of says arrow this way, which means we need to crank this direction. So we crank this direction. Oops, now it says you went too far. We have to crank this direction. Oh, you went too far. And so you get these two lights to kind of be right where they are. And then you can start looking at the, uh, at the balance over here and kind of fine tuning it, trying to find out right where it's balanced. So it's, this is the uh, uh, balance on the bridge. And so it's 262 or 26.2 nanofarads, 26.2 nanofarads, okay? So I have a uh, uh, LCR meter over here. So let's go ahead and connect it up and see what it says. Can you read that? Make sure you can read that. There we go. 26.2. <laughs> Pretty good, huh? <laughs> Pretty good for this old instrument. Yeah, I like it. All right. So let's do a uh, let's do an inductor here. So I'll go over here to inductance. Put the inductor on the unknown. And start flipping some range switches here. Not doing much. Oh, there we go. See, it's starting to starting to do this, so we can go in this direction. Things are going smaller. Oh, there we go. So it's around 0.3 millihenries. So we'll go to microhenries, and it says to crank in this direction. So we'll crank in this direction. Oh, went too far. Right around, right around there. 333. Right, 334, 334 microhenries. Right, so let's put it on the tester over here. Let's see what it says. 332. So certainly within one percent, I think. Yeah, 332. Three people one nine. 332, and this one says 334. Yeah, not too bad. Not too bad. And uh, so that's kind of a brief introduction. We'll play with a little more in future videos, see how the D and the Q work and uh, things like that. But uh, yeah, pretty cool instrument. Automatic uh, decimal point, automatic range switching, automatic uh, uh, quality factor dispersion, all with transistors. 